Welcome everybody uh, to the genetics seminar series. Um, it's really a it's really a true honor to introduce Professor um, Mike Levine, who is the director of the Louis Sigler Institute of Integrative Genomics at Princeton University and, and a faculty of molecular biology in the department at Princeton, where he arrived in 2015 after uh, many years at Berkeley and before that at UCSD in Columbia. And um, although um, he has never been a faculty at Yale, I think that his connections to Yale provide really some fundamental and long-lasting enhancer contributions that, that have had a long-lasting effect on, on his academic career. So Professor Levine uh, did his undergraduate at Berkeley, um, and then he decided to move to Yale for his PhD with uh, Alan Garren at MBMB, and he actually um, uh, got the highest honor of um, of, uh, of Yale as a former graduate student with the Wilbur Cross Medal um, in 2009. And then for his postdoc, um, he uh, tried to ask a fundamental question in developmental biology and gene regulation, and it's how do you interpret the DNA to specify different body parts? Um, this is still a long lasting question, and but he made a major contribution um, uh, stemming from the fact that there were mutants at a time in Drosophila where, you know, one part of the body became a different part. This were homeotic transformation. Um, and this happened with genes and mutations mutation such as antenna pedia and ultrabithorax. And so during his postdoc in Switzerland with Walter Gehring, who was a former um, Yale faculty, uh, he really had one of the biggest discoveries in the field of gene regulation at a time. The, the discovery that the homeobox, the homeobox domain, uh, together with Ern Hafend and, and William McKinnon. Uh, and this basically was a major discovery because, you know, steaming from a theory from Ed Lewis that, you know, these homeotic transformations could be based on a gene that might have a common evolutionary region, and therefore they might have some conserved sequences. So basically they use this conserved sequence on the Antenapedia gene to um, to really fish out this conserved domain of the homeobox, um, you know, which is, as you know, a transcription factor, a domain that recognizes specific DNA sequences. And he went then, uh, went on in, at Columbia as a faculty to then identify the sequence, some of the sequence reconditions of the homeobox domain. Um, so this is one of the pieces that really help us interpret or understand how cells interpret the genome through the recognition of uh, sequence specific transcription factors. Um, and then um, later as a faculty, he also another major discovery was trying to answer the question of how do organisms develop spatial specific expression patterns from uh, more global gene expressions or from gradients of, of proteins? And as you know, in the Drosophila, um, access specification, you have gradients of proteins, but in, in the subsequent gene expression, you get uh, very sharp boundaries of gene expressions, like for example, for the, for the gene Eve, as I think you can see here. So one of the discoveries of Mike really um, was able to understand that specific DNA sequences on, on genes are able to provide a spatial expression by the recognition from transcription factors and transcriptional repressors. Um, you know, uh, and he had many other discoveries like the dorsal ultron patterning and how NFK beta a signaling pathway um, uh, induces the dorsal ultron patterning. You know, quoting Sean Carroll, Sean Carroll, one of the greatest developmental biologists says two of the big discoveries had a very large conceptual significance for developmental biology and in extension uh, for evolutionary biology. Um, Mike has received multiple awards, um, just to name a few. Uh, he was selected to member of the European Molecular Biology Organization, a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, uh, is president, he was president in, in 2012 of the Society for Developmental Biology. 
um, the Cochrane Medal, um, uh, and also a Searle Scholar and Jane Coffin Child Postdoctoral Fellow. So it's really a true pleasure to have you here, Mike, uh, and we love for a lively discussion and a wonderful uh, scientific talk. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. I, I think I should just play with the house money and, and, and quit after that lovely uh, introduction. But uh, I'll say a few words. I'm gonna try to keep it uh, brief. First of all, I'm very excited to see Joan Stites in the front row. You know, when I first arrived here as a graduate student at MBNB in 1976, uh, Joan and Tom kindly hosted the entire MBNB first year class to dinner at your house. And it was really fantastic. I mean, it immediately made us feel like we were part of this great community. And I think that is the special attribute of, of Yale. There is a real intimacy of the associations between faculty, postdocs, and, and students here that I haven't seen anywhere else. I, I, I think it really is uh, a, a wonderful culture. And so thank you for that. Uh, right. Uh, for 40 years, my lab has studied gene regulation using uh, primarily the early Drosophila embryo uh, as an assay system. Most of these studies are really focused on uh, transcriptional enhancers, which are the key switches and turning genes uh, on and off in response to developmental processes and in disease. And I realized all these years later that many of these studies were greatly influenced by the lac operon. I know it's weird to start with the lac operon, but for me, after all these 40 years of studying gene control, I've never encountered a more elegant mechanism of gene control than the lac operon. And when I was an undergraduate at Berkeley and a graduate student here at Yale, this was the paradigm uh, for gene control. In molecular biology classes, uh, we learned how RNA polymerase and the lac repressor compete for overlapping operator and promoter sites. In biochemistry, we learned about the beautiful process of Alice theory, where the lactose molecule binds to the repressor to kick it off the DNA so polymerase can transcribe the operon. And then in genetics, of course, you learn about these wonderful constitutive mutants that either cause only activation or repression by having constitutive uh, operator sites or promoter sites. It just doesn't get, you know, for me, it doesn't get better than that. The key to the lac operon and bacterial operons in general and gene regulation in simple eukaryotes uh, is the promoter as a regulatory switch, as, a, as, as the on-off switch. Most, most of the action in bacteria, and I would say even in yeast, occur within the first few hundred base pairs of the transcription start site. Well, that's not true in uh, animal development. In metazoans, instead of a regulatory switch at the promoter, the action's at a distance. And uh, here, is there a pointer? Or I guess I can use my, no, you don't really see the arrow. Now, come on, one of you guys has to have a little red pointer sitting in your briefcase because I don't have one. And no, all right, I, I'll, I'll. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. There's stuff down here. Hang on. Yeah, it's locked. You know, they know me, so it's locked up. <laughs> eh, it's okay. Oh, really? oh, very good. Thank you so much. Where, where would I be without the pointer? And besides, if I have to keep, you know, leaning into the screen, you'll simply see the bald patch on the back of my head, which is very depressing to me. Okay. Is it? Oh, yeah, here we go. Hang on. All right, there we go. Very good. So in the case of uh, animal development, you get a series of cell-specific patterns of expression that are regulated by separate enhancers located at variable distances from the promoter from a couple of kilobases. And in some cases, I'll show you an example, up to a megabase, you know, very big distances. And each of these enhancers produces a subset of the total pattern. So here you see the seven stripes of even skipped expression, a segmentation gene. And these are regulated by five separate enhancers located both upstream and downstream of the transcription start site. Uh, these enhancers, when we first found them, 
uh, it became apparent that they're different from the very first enhancers that were identified, mainly in animal viruses, such as SV40. The viral enhancers are fairly short, one to 200 base pairs in length, and contain binding sites for pleiotropic activators, such as NF-kappa B. The developmental enhancers, such as those regulating uh, the eave stripes, contain, are, are larger, they're more like 500 base pairs in length, and they have binding sites not only for activators, but also for transcription and repressors. We often forget that a lot of enhancers are regulated by localized repressors, and I'll summarize that uh, for the even skip uh, strike two enhancer. Uh -oh. I'm having some technical difficulties in advancing my slides. Hang on. Is there a, yeah, no, I did that. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, just hit the mouse. All right. So this just summarizes one of the developmental enhancers controlling those seven Eve stripes. And uh, this is typical of the other uh, four enhancers. This enhancer controls the expression of strike number two. It's 500 base pairs in length. It contains a series of binding sites for transcriptional activators like bicoid, which in principle could switch the enhancer on throughout the anterior half of the embryo. But the enhancer also contains binding sites for localized repressors. And you see one of those repressors called giant in green. Giant's expressed in two domains, but I'm just focusing on this anterior domain of giant expression. It's a leucine zipper transcriptional repressor. It binds to the stripe two enhancer and forms that sharp anterior stripe border. So you can see the normal giant pattern tightly straddles the stripe two uh, anterior border and it forms that border through repression. A different localized repressor called crupal, expressed in central regions of the embryo, form the posterior border of each strike two. And we're able to see the action of the transcriptional repressors in li living embryos. And this is really the reason why I moved to Princeton. I didn't move to Princeton to become a fancy director. That's not really my thing. I moved to Princeton because Liz Gavis and Thomas Greger uh, developed a method for doing quantitative life imaging. And I had to go even though it was in New Jersey, I had to go to the place where the fly movies were being made. And so I'm going to show you an example of uh, the movies we've been making since I arrived at Princeton uh, seven and a half years ago. So this is a high magnification view of a wild type embryo, which carries a transgene, carrying the Eve Stripe 2 enhancer attached to a reporter and the reporter has a series of MS2 stem loops. And Rob Singer worked out a method for detecting the nascent transcripts by the binding of the bacteriophage protein to the MS2 stem loops, the MCP capsid protein to MS2. So you're going to see green dots and only one green dot because these are heterozygotes carrying just one copy of the transgene. And those are the nascent RNAs made from the strike 2 transgene. Initially, you'll see the transcription is very broadly transcribed throughout the embryo. They're silencing at mitosis. We're now entering the final one hour interphase leading to the formation of stripes. Giant forms the anterior border, crupal the posterior border, and then the enhancer disappears. And it disappears because there's a separate enhancer in the Eve regulatory region, which maintains the pattern after the stripe is formed, which is not contained in this transgene. So, I don't know, maybe it didn't mean much to you, but these movies for me were totally mesmerizing. I'm from Hollywood, California, and I love movies, and that's the closest thing to my godfather. Although I should note that I'm really in the Hollywood spirit, like a Jewish movie producer, because of course I didn't make that movie. That movie was made by Jacques Boffma and um, another graduate student in the lab. So I financed it. Okay, very good. So one property of developmental enhancers that distinguish them from the original, uh, you know, uh, prototypic viral enhancers is regulation by repressors. 
Another very salient property of developmental enhancers is their ability to co-regulate uh, 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 linked genes. And so what you see here is an experiment that was uh, set up by Takashi Fugaya and Bomi Lim, two former postdocs in the lab. They place a number of developmental enhancers in this three prime position downstream of two reporters containing MS2 stem loops as I described and a, another bacteriophage system, PP7 stem loops. And this permits visualization of the nascent RNAs from these reporters in green or red. They have identical promoters and our expectation from classical looping models is that the enhancer would randomly select one of the promoters, produce a transcriptional burst, come part, and then once again, it would be jump ball, and you would randomly select one of the promoters, and in this way, get alternating red and green stripes on a per nucleus basis. But as you can see, that's not what we observe. Instead, we observe co-bursting of the two reporters by individual uh, developmental enhancers. This is a fairly weak developmental enhancer. It's only producing three bursts over the 30-minute time frame uh, of analysis. So you see pretty good co-bursting of the PP7 and MS2 reporter genes, and then a lag period, and then another burst, and so forth. And this is a very consistent trend. Uh, the developmental enhancers are co-activating the linked genes. And these two promoters are separated by about 16 kilobases in length. And that prompted us to propose, as, as many have proposed now, a transcriptional hub model where the shared enhancer co-regulates uh, linked reporter genes by virtue of these large aggregates or condensates of RNA polymerase, the blue ovals, uh, at the promoter. So somehow the enhancer forms, you know, seeds the assembly of these aggregates of polymerase. They're very large, doesn't require the enhancer to come into direct contact with the promoter. And then an activation occur, event occurs to release these polymerases from the hub to give co-bursting of the two genes. So those are two properties of developmental enhancers I wanted to briefly summarize, regulation by, repressor, by repression and uh, the ability of enhancers to co-activate two or even three linked genes. Another uh, very striking property of developmental enhancers is their ability to work over very long distances. Uh, and a very nice example has been provided by uh, in Bob Hill's lab, uh, Lettuce and Hill, who've published a series of papers over the years that next to the LAC operon are kind of my favorite uh, example of gene regulation in development. Uh, this is for the sonic hedgehog gene, which is regulated by many, many enhancers. The enhancer that's responsible for localized expression of the developing limb buds of uh, mice and humans is located one megabase away. In fact, it's located within the intron uh, of a neighboring gene. And how do you achieve this kind of long range regulation? And there's more and more examples of this in uh, mammalian development. Joanna Wysocka studying the SOX9 locus has identified developmental enhancers which are important for facial patterning of the neural crest. Uh, that map about one and a half megabases away. So how does an enhancer over that distance ignore nearby promoters, which is it's embedded in, and instead get targeted to the sonic hedgehog gene? And that's what I'm mainly going to talk about uh, for the rest of my lecture. We attempted to uh, reconstruct artificially a long-range association in the early Drosophila embryo by placing a single enhancer just upstream of a PP7 reporter gene on one chromosomal homolog. And then in the same position of the genome, but on the other homolog, inserting an MS2 reporter gene. The only way you get green is through a trans homolog activation of MS2 by the shared enhancer located on the other chromosome. And in the early fly embryo, we never saw this activation unless we inserted these architectural 
elements involved in genome folding called insulator DNAs in Drosophila or boundary elements in mammals. And these are the same kind of boundary elements that form topological associating domains or TADs, which I'll discuss in a moment. So when the insulators were placed just upstream of the reporter genes, now you can get pairing of the two alleles. Now with a super high frequency in about 10% of the nuclei uh, where the gene is active, you get this nice pairing of the alleles and you get transactivation of the two reporter genes by the shared enhancer. And so I'm gonna show this very beautiful movie made by Mustafa Mir when he was a postdoc with uh, Xavier Darzac at Berkeley. And uh, you see nice co-bursting of the two genes. Uh, remember the red is kind of a surrogate for the location of the shared enhancer because the enhancer is right next to it. And the green is going along for the ride. That is due to uh, transactivation. And you can see that they are very much uh, coordinated in their regulation. If you look carefully, you can see the two alleles were kind of bouncing away from each other, coming back together. And there is a kind of an oscillation. And we believe that the insulators are sort of constraining how far the enhancer can move away from its uh, target promoter. But mainly what I want to discuss today is a second class of architectural elements that we started to work on 20 years ago, but really couldn't uh, make good progress on until the last uh, year or two. And these are called tethering elements. So first of all, this summarizes the different classes of cis-regulatory DNAs uh, in our genomes. Of course, there's the promoter and then a distal enhancer. Usually there are multiple enhancers. They are bounded by boundary elements or insulators, which form these topological associating domains. And there's a lot of evidence that these boundaries or insulators prevent enhancers from regulating the wrong genes next door. Most enhancer promoter communication occurs within the limits of boundaries or insulators within topological associating domains. But there's a fourth cis-regulatory element that uh, I would like to highlight today, and we call these tethering elements. And uh, former graduate student Vince Calhoun, about 20 years ago when the lab was still in Berkeley, obtained evidence for tethering elements while he studied the regulation of the stripe of SCR expression. SCR is one of the eight Hox genes in the Drosophila genome. It's in the Antennapedia complex. And uh, Vince identified an enhancer located about 40 kilobases upstream of the promoter that's important for this stripe. And he identified GAGA rich elements that he referred to as tethering elements one located near the distal enhancer and one located near the promoter. And he hypothesized that these tethering elements somehow physically associated to bring the enhancer into proximity with the SCR promoter. But really there was nothing we could do to test, critically test that hypothesis because the technology just wasn't there. And the specific technology we required as I'll show you was the quantitative live imaging of course, the genome editing developed by Doudna and Charpentier has just been transformative, I think, for all of us. And the construction of high C chromosome confirmation capture maps. And using these three methods, 3C maps, live imaging, and genome editing, it was possible to manipulate the tethering elements and get some insights as to how they work. So here you see uh, a micro C map of a particular region of the Antennapedia complex containing two Hox genes, Antennapedia and SCR, which I mentioned, it's expressed in that stripe right at the cephalic furrow at the boundary between the head and the thorax. SCR is contained in a 90 kilobase TAD. That's what this uh, micro C contact map tells us. And the enhancer that Vince identified, the SR, SCREE, is located here, about 40 kilobases upstream, on the other side of a segmentation gene called FUTS. So the enhancer has to bypass FUTS and selectively interact with SCR. And we like those properties because that's very vertebrate properties. Enhancer skipping is not that common in Drosophila, but quite common 
in vertebrate uh, genomes. And you see a nice focal contact here in the micro C map. And that coincides with these two anchor sequences, the two tethering elements identified by Vince 20 years ago, a distal tethering element located upstream of the SCR enhancer and a proximal tethering element located right at the SCR promoter. And these clearly physically associate to give you that focal contact. So uh, Philippe Batut, the postdoc in the lab, who's gone back and used these new technologies to re-examine uh, Vince's work from 20 years ago, did a number of manipulations uh, in the Antennapedia complex. He used genome editing to remove different uh, boundaries and tethering elements. And I'm just showing one of his results here. This is a simple deletion of this distal tethering element. There's a loss of this focal contact. And most strikingly, there's a delay in the onset of transcription of SCO. Um, of about, it doesn't seem like much, of uh, 10 minutes. If you do that fractional for the cell cycle, if you think about your more glacial cell cycles and let's say developing mouse embryos, that would equate to more like two hours, you know, two hour lag. Uh, because everything's happening so frightfully fast in the early Drosophila embryo. We believe that that's a meaningful delay, and it is associated with the classical homeotic phenotype. The adult males have fewer than normal sex cones, which is what the SCR gene does. So that gray line shows the normal timing, the normal onset of the SCR stripe and wild-type embryos, and the cyan line shows what happens when you have a homozygous mutant embryo lacking both copies of the distal tethering element. And Philippe has identified, has, has obtained more evidence that tethering elements are very important for the timing of gene expression. And I gotta tell you, uh, this is the truth. There is nothing more important for me than timing. So I get older, I have really come to appreciate time and any mechanism that may contribute to timing. And it makes me think, how do genomes tell time? And uh, one way they do it, uh, I believe, is through tethering elements. Uh, whenever Philippe disrupts a tethering element, you're going to see in a couple more examples shortly, there is a delay in the uh, onset of transcription. The thinking is, is that the tethering elements bring the SCR enhancer into proximity with the SCR promoter. As soon as the activators bind to the enhancer, you're off to the races. You get kind of this jump start by virtue of the tether-tether association, which occurs quite early in the embryo. And then when you disrupt that, well, now you're extending the search time for the enhancer to find the SCR promoter. It's got to bypass FUDs and get to the SCR promoter within this 90 KB TAD. That takes a little longer and hence uh, the delay. Is there in uh, every tether element can be interacting with every tether element? Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, just to give you the quick answer in the early fly embryo during the period you would be interested in, you know, it's kind of the equivalent of the period that you guys study in uh, zebrafish. There are 400 tethering elements that are active forming 200 uh, loops. 100 of the loops are like this. They're, they're bringing distal enhancers into proximity with promoters over a distance of 20 to 200 kilobases within TADs, and they're important for timing. The other 100 loops are promoter-promoter, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about those. But you know, the question of whether there are different flavors of tethers, do you have different codes? I think you do. And I'll show you a little bit of evidence for that in a few minutes. Okay. Yeah, please. How was it to me that you don't see more value? I'm sorry, I'm deaf in my left ear. I'm like Caesar. Please tell me what you really think of Mark Antony in my good ear. <laughs> You know, it's true. It's it's um, it's really uniform. I mean, and even the levels of transcription become quite respectable without the distal tethering element. And that's that that is. I, I agree with you. We expected when you disrupt these, we would get more embryo to embryo and cell to cell variability, and we don't see that. So the TAD, we think is still doing something, right? The TAD's not bad as a means for constraining enhancer promoter communication. Now we haven't done the double mutant of deleting both 
the distal tethering element, and let's say that red oval to the right in, in Tenopedia, that boundary element, you know, what would, um, and there I would guess we would see more variability, but we haven't done that experiment. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So what happens if we delete some of those boundary elements at FUTs? Right. So FUTs, you know, FUTs lacks tethering elements. Uh, the promoter region doesn't have tethers. All of its enhancers are really close by. When Philippe removes let's say that three prime boundary, that three prime uh, red oval downstream of the FUTS transcription unit. Whoops, when he deletes this boundary, the um, enhancer really doesn't get trapped on the FUTS promoter. It is still targeted to SCR, even in the absence of this uh, tad in the middle here, because of the tether-tether association. The tether-tether association really overrides uh, any perturbations you, you create in FUTs. It, now, I think Philippe has inserted tethering elements into the FUTs promoter, and then I think the outcome is very different. Right. So ah. the Yeah. Now it's not those tethering, like safe tethering, but right. Searching, right. there's a gene in the middle, like right? by difference. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, why don't you go in there? It's kind of sealed off in its own tad. So, you know, FUTS does have these two boundary elements, and you can see that little triangle there and a little volcano. That's the FUTS gene, which is functioning quite autonomously within. The, S, the greater SCR TAD spanning the entire SCR regulatory region. So I don't think the enhancer gets lost in that TAD. I think it's just excluded by those uh, two insulators, by those two boundary elements. Now, Matt, that's a, that's a really good question. I'll tell you, uh, and I think this explains this delay. The enhancer, normally because of this tether tether association, is very directed to the SCR promoter. When Philippe removes this DTE, he now sees the enhancer forming lots of contacts upstream. It's like moving backwards. You know, it's just, it's lost. And so now it's sampling the entire TAD. It's not as constrained in its directionality, and it's just kind of flapping its wings all over the TAD. And so it takes longer to find the SCR promoter in the absence of the tether. Okay. Right. So. I just want, this is just a very brief digression. The theme is time. And we think the tethering elements, however the mechanism works, is important for timely activation of critical genes like uh, the Hox genes. Uh, Philippe identified, Philippe loves non-coding RNAs. And um, he noticed that the SCR enhancer is itself transcribed. That's not rare to make eRNAs. We don't think it's really an eRNA. There is a promoter at the three prime edge of the SCR enhancer, which leads to a long link RNA. We call it the link eRNA. And it's about an 8 KB transcription unit with an intron, but it's non coding. It's a link RNA that originates within the uh, SCR enhancer. So somewhere between an eRNA and a link RNA. And Philippe noticed some old literature suggesting that, ironically, that this link RNA made from the enhancer that regulates SCR might produce an inhibitory effect on SCR expression. So in the early embryo, you get this broad band of the link RNA. That's what you see in red here. And SCR is not on. It comes on quite late. And then later in a wild type embryo, the link RNA sharpens up and you start losing expression 
in the region where SCR comes on. Okay, so I switch colors on you here. Now the link RNA is green. The first SCR transcripts are in magenta. So it looked like there was a mutually exclusive effect going on here. As long as you had the link RNA, SCR was off. As the link RNA diminished or sharpened, SCR can come on. And so Philippe tested the idea that the link RNA, although it's coming from the enhancer that activates SCR, is nonetheless important for inhibiting it and getting the proper timing of gene expression. He simply deleted the transcription start site within the embryonic enhancer, and he gets very striking precocious activation of SCR in the early embryo, consistent with the idea that the link RNA is somehow inhibiting the timing of SCR transcription. How? We don't know, but there's 100,000 link RNAs in the human genome, and I will humbly submit to you the idea that many of these are important for the timing of gene expression, you know, which mostly people have not uh, looked at. It could be a very subtle thing. In this case, I mean, SCR comes on 20 minutes earlier uh, when you remove that link RNA than normal. That's a bigger effect than removing the tethering element. So it's a, it's a pretty significant effect for the system. Okay, so I, I just mentioned two mechanisms of timing, uh, the tethers and uh, these non-coding uh, link RNAs that occur between enhancers and their target promoters could also be influencing uh, timing. So I mentioned uh, in response to Antonio's question that there are 200 loops in the early embryo, 100 are like what I described for SCR, uh, a long range enhancer promoter interaction. The other 100 loops uh, are like this. They bring together two different promoters, typically of paralogous genes. So this shows the Knerps locus, one of the classical segmentation genes in Drosophila. And uh, Knerps is not alone, it's joined by a paralog called Knerps related, which clearly arose from a gene duplication event, which are extremely common in metazoan genomes. The two promoters are separated by 74 kilobases, and each promoter contains a tethering element, just like the tethering elements I described for SCR. GAGA -GA rich, one is located just upstream of Knerps, the other just upstream of Knerps related, they physically associate to give you this very nice focal contact, bringing the two promoter regions together. And this is a, a, a cartoon of what we imagine is going on. The green ovals are the tethering elements near the two promoters. They come together to bring these distant genes, although they're 74 kilobases in length and linear distance, they're now brought into physical association through topology raising the possibility that they could be co-regulated by shared enhancers. And a fantastic postdoc who's in fact, uh, I think coming here for a job interview in MCDB in a day or two, uh, Michal Levo uh, tested this idea that the two tethering elements are bringing Knerps and Knerps related together for co-regulation by doing live imaging. So she inserted within the endogenous loci, everything I showed you before were reporter genes, but now she's manipulating endogenous loci using CRISPR-Cas9. She inserted PP7 into the endogenous Knerps-related gene and MS2 stem loops into Knerps. And here's an anterior stripe of expression regulated by the shared enhancer located very close to Knerps-related, quite far from Knerps, but you can see it's co-regulating the two genes. So this is a quantitative trace from a single nucleus uh, in this anterior stripe with time on the x-axis in minutes and y is the fluorescence intensity. And you see pretty good co-bursting of the two genes over this distance. Now, and you know, this upsets some people, but I was very excited when uh, Michal and another postdoc in the lab, Joao Raimundo, obtained evidence for this we refer to them as topological operons. I already told you about my love of operons. So this is an homage 
to what I consider to be the most glorious, uh, really the most elegant form of gene regulation. And the idea is you bring these two distant genes together through the tethers. They're not physically linked the way the different genes of a lac opera, like, like operons are, which are basically polystestronic genes. But nonetheless, they're brought into close physical proximity, and this enables them to be regulated by a nearby single switch. So, it, you know, it has some of the regulatory properties of uh, the glorious bacterial uh, operons. So out of respect, we call them topological operons. And Joao found that these topological operons can uh, contain genes separated by 240 kilobases. So this is the same setup I showed you before. The two genes have tethering elements. We can see in the high C contact maps, they're brought into physical proximity. Joao found a shared enhancer upstream of Scylla, which gives you this nice band of expression on the top of the embryo. And the shared enhancer regulates both the nearby Scylla gene over a distance of about five kilobases, as well as the distant Charybde gene over a distance of nearly 250 kilobases. And here's the same setup. There's a quantitative trace from a live movie of a single nucleus. And here you first see only a green burst of Scylla without any Charybde. And we think that's because after mitosis, it takes a little while, there's a lag, when the two tethering elements over this big distance can find each other. And only after they find each other, now do you get the topological operon and the co-regulation of the two genes by the shared enhancer. And uh, in this experiment, Joao removed this distal tethering element located next to the shared enhancer. It doesn't affect activation of Scylla. Scylla doesn't need tethers. It's the enhancer's right there. But Charybde shows that same delay that I described for SCR and much lower expression, shorter bursts, longer interburst intervals, and a loss of coordination in the transcription of the two genes. So the tethering elements are important for timing and for coordinating the expression of uh, distant uh, paralongs like Scylla and Charybde. And this is not a rare thing. Something like 30% of all the most important patterning genes operating in the Drosophila embryo uh, contain two or even three paralogs that are brought together by tethering elements within a topological operon. And I'm guessing that number is even going to be higher proportionally in vertebrate systems, if anything. We were talking about that, right? About the link paralogs. Anyway, so just to kind of conclude this part, and you know, I'm mostly done. Uh, you know, how do we think about tethering elements and what they're doing? And I think about it uh, in terms of something I was never able to do as a kid growing up in Los Angeles, and that was to trap a firefly in a jar. Those of you who grew up on the East Coast were very lucky. And as an adult, I did all the stuff you did as kids. I trapped them in a jar. I you know, squeezed their abdomen and wrote my name on the wall and did all that stuff. Sadly, as an adult, when I moved to Yale, in fact, that I couldn't do in Los Angeles because we don't have fireflies. But the idea is if, the, if, that, if that glow on the abdomen is the enhancer, bringing light to the promoter, and you, say, you imagine that blade of grass as your pause polymerase at a target gene for the enhancer, what the tethering elements are doing is constraining the search space. For the, it's just putting the, you know, the firefly kind of on a leash so that it has you know, less landscape to traverse in order to make that incidental contact with its target promoter and activate gene expression. So this is how we're, so it's kind of a firefly model for how tethering elements uh, may work. So I just want to say a few things. Yeah, please. So the coordinating burst suggests that in addition, the tether element really provide much more constraint than the firefly in the jar because you have this coordination. So there has to be something else that provides that. Okay, 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 let's talk about that. I, 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 I see where you're going. So I should have two blades of grass there, right? For the two promoters of the two. Well, now they're close together. Now they're close together. So it's true that the promoters are in a jar as well, right? They're also constrained. 
So it's not perfect, right? But for all we know, when that firefly comes here, it could be separately activating those two piles of polymerase that are brought into physical proximity. We don't know because our time resolution is about 20 to 30 seconds. All I can tell you when I say co-bursting, within 20 to 30 seconds. So for all we know, the firefly is doing this, going back and forth between the two uh, pause polymerases on the, on the two promoters to activate expression. We don't know. We don't know if it's truly simultaneous and there's truly one source of polymerase for both promoters. We don't know. We imagine that's the case, but we don't. Okay, so I'm gonna say a few things about how tethering elements work and then talk about a very recent finding in the lab of uh, metal loops in the brain. Not much more time, okay. So there's hope. Uh, right. Peter Verizer and others 20 years ago uh, showed that a protein called GAF, GAG associated factor, binds to GAGA -GA repeats and has a looping activity. And its looping activity is mediated by this N terminal POZ or BTB domain, which uh, causes oligomerization of the GAF protein. And they did in vitro studies, including EM studies, showing that they can bring together two separate DNA molecules, both with GAGA elements on them, with a, a GAF oligomer. And so they have this model for looping through oligomerization of the POZ domain. Now, it's hard for us to study GAF in the early fly embryo because of the huge maternal supply of the protein. And so a uh, postdoc in the lab, Xiao Li, switched to uh, imaginal disks and larval tissues, because by then you run out of the maternal stores and you're dependent solely on the zygotic expression of GAF, and he can start seeing phenotypes. So in collaboration with Carl Wu's lab, uh, Xiao obtained larvae that are homozygous for a mutant form of the endogenous GAF protein lacking the POZ domain and lacking this ability to form uh, oligomers. And he found that 20% of the active topological operons in the wing disc, so, you know, link paralogs that are separated by anywhere between 50 and 250 kilobases that are brought together by the promoter proximal tethering elements, six of the 30 show this situation where the Promoter-promoter association at this focal contact is greatly diminished or lost. Not 100%, but 20% are lost in these GAF mutants. There's a lot of redundancy as this so happens. There are several other proteins that are co-expressed with GAF that also contain POS BO, BTB domains that we know interact with GAF. These are MDG4 and bric-a-brac. And uh, we're in the process of trying to get rid of them all to see if there's a more dramatic loss of these focal contacts. But the writing is on the wall that these POS BTB proteins are very important for homotypic, long range physical associations of distant DNAs. And they may fall into different classes. It could be that these 20%, those six of 30 toporons that are greatly diminished, rely more exclusively on GAF than some of the other tethering elements, which may rely on one of the other BTB pause proteins like MDG4 or bric-a-brac. And we're, we're testing that idea by removing those proteins. Okay. And then uh, in the course of these studies, since Xiao completely broke bad and he left my beloved early fly embryo, the two to three hour embryo that we've focused most of our studies on over the years, and he started to do micro C assays on different larval tissues, like what I just showed you there, the wing imaginal disc. He looked at the larval and adult brains and he sees something you just don't see in any other tissue. And that is super long range associations of very distant regions of individual chromosomes. This is the entire Drosophila genome. It contains you know, all these uh, one, 
two, three, four different chromosomes. And you see these dots uh, that span large regions of individual chromosome arms. Each chromosome arm has about 25 to 30 megabases of DNA. These dots are not like the dots I showed you before of 100 KB or so. These dots span two to 20 megabases, uh, almost encompassing the entire chromosome arm in some cases. And so what are these? And again, this is absolutely specific to the larval and the adult brain, which you can argue is the only really complex tissue in Drosophila. You know, there's lots of different you know, uh, subtypes. The fly brain has 130, 100,000 neurons. 70% of those are dedicated to the visual system, you know, to looking at their environment. And what these dots are, are very specific ta pairwise TAD associations. Individual TADs, not a bunch of TADs glomming together, but one TAD over here, jumping over 20 TADs to find another TAD over here on the other chromosome arm and pairing up. Sometimes they pair through their boundaries, as in this TAD, TAD association over a distance of about 13 megabases. Sometimes the TADs pair, as in this case, over a distance of nearly seven megabases, but then they have focal contacts within, which are tether-tether associations. So the TADs somehow pair very specifically, and then you get tether-tether associations, the same tethering elements I described, to give you really long-range associations. And uh, this is the last data slide, the penultimate slide. And this shows one example. Uh, this shows two different TADs. One contains sticks and stones. One contains hybris. The two TADs are separated by over six megabases on the right arm of chromosome two. These are paralogs, and they encode extracellular Ig repeat containing proteins important for axonal guidance in the visual system. And uh, past studies suggest that hybris is expressed in the stripe within the developing tectum. I mean, I know nothing about the nervous system, but the developing tectum of the visual system of the larval brain. And that enhancer maps 100 kilobases downstream. I'll call it a stripe enhancer for this kind of heart-shaped uh, expression pattern of both hybris and sticks and stones. Now, this is this POZ mutant in GAF. There are 25 of these metal loops, 25 pairs of TADs come together, an average of five per chromosome arm. Only one of them shows this effect in the POZ mutants, and that's this hybris, sticks and stones, TAD-TAD association is greatly diminished in the POZ homozygotes. You take the larval brain from this mutant that has an abnormal GAF protein, and you get a substantial reduction in the association of these two distant TADs. And that seems to correlate with a significant reduction in sticks and stones expression in the stripe. So we think, and Xiao is testing this now, that this enhancer located three prime of hybris works over a distance of nearly seven megabases to activate sticks and stones through the metal loop. And when you disrupt the metal loop in this pause mutant, now the enhancer really can't activate sticks and stones. So, you know, I'm proud of that because the mammalian people make such a big stink out of a mere one megabase enhancer promoter interaction in the case of Sonic Hedgehog, we're talking seven megabases in the lowly fly. And a colleague of mine at Princeton, Yuri Pritikin, has evidence for these kinds of long range associations in mammalian T cells. Of course, flies don't have a specific immune system. They don't have that other really complex tissue of immune tissue where you might expect to see these associations. I can tell you that some of the metal loops take very important uh, axon guidance genes and bring them under the control of novel enhancers. So you might have a tethering element, three megabases over here, now able to communicate with a gene important for axon guidance way over here through tether-tether associations. And that allows the gene to acquire a novel pattern of expression and presumably a new uh, neuronal subtype. 
In summary, I presented evidence that tethering elements are involved in the multi-scale folding of the regulatory genome. They're important for short range interactions of enhancers and promoters over a distance of about 20 to 100 kilobases. They're important for longer range promoter-promoter associations within TADS over distances of 25 to 250 kilobases. And remarkably, about one fourth of all the tethering elements are involved in these ultra long range associations over megabases. I think this is just an example of nature using every trick in the book to produce novelty and sophistication in the fly visual system. And I'm sure something similar is, is going on in, in, in vertebrates, in, in, including humans. I wanna thank the uh, fantastic team of uh, postdocs. I really do feel blessed as an aging guy, you know, getting near the end of the cell cycle here. I said, eh, maybe I'm around the uh, telophase and maybe it's more like anaphase, I don't know. I talked about uh, Philippe's work. I mean, they're all on the job. Uh, Xiao's not on the job market, the other three on the job market. Philippe did the work on the SCR and timing, uh, SCR tethering element. Xiao did the work on the uh, metal loops I, I, I just described. Uh, Michal, who's truly a force of nature, she uh, started out as a bioinformaticist working with Aren Siegel and studying promoters in yeast on whole genomics, and now works with mainly Thomas Greger and in my lab to do really the biophysics of uh, transcriptional control and the live imaging. And uh, Joao Raimundo was the one who uh, figured out that those two tethering elements that uh, Vince found are actually uh, scattered throughout the genome and that there are 400 of them. And with that, I'll uh, stop and take any more questions. Thanks for your attention. Oh, very good. Okay, I'm gonna ask the first question with the implant, the link and has RNA. And yes. Repression. Yes. Okay. So Bonnie Kumar asks, is it just transcription of the link enhancer RNA that is sufficient for repression or will it recruit other repressors with these? Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's a great question. Uh, I don't really have a good answer for that now. I can tell you that the promoter in the enhancer that produces that link eRNA is a rather weak promoter. And when Philippe, inserts a stronger promoter in that position, he gets a further delay in the onset of uh, SCR transcription. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the RNA that's working to inhibit, let's say the looping of the DTE and the proximal uh, tethering element, or if it's something about the promoter and promoter competition and sequestering the enhancer, we're not sure. Believe it's, it's for very complicated reasons likes the idea that the link RNA itself is interfering with the timely association of the two tethering elements and the formation of the loop. And it's based on some genetic epistasis arguments. And the second question in the chat is about the meta loops. Uh, so Lynn Cooley asked, are there central nervous system meta loops in neurons or the glial cells? Yeah, you know, we haven't done enough single cell analysis we know that they're in neurons. Uh, the expression patterns we see there are primarily neurons, but with the uh, micro C method, we're just grinding up. I mean, Xiao's grinding up whole larval and adult brains. And so we don't really know where a lot of these focal contact. I would guess they're gonna be in glia as well for the simple reason that the adult brain is really complicated we suddenly go up from 200 loops and 400 tethering elements to like 800 loops genome-wide in the adult brain. So suddenly there is a huge increase in the folding of the genome in that adult brain. And we would like to get to the bottom of that. Um, can you speculate how these super long range interactions like 
evolve? Is there like some sort of conservation of other invertebrates that you think is unique to these invertebrates with this invertebrate with this complex? Now you had dinner with me last night, so you know perfectly well how dangerous it is to ask me to speculate because we could, you know, we could be here all day. You know, I don't think it's that hard. So let's say you've got this really critical gene, and we know like LAR, Bruno Zim has been working, I mean, Kai Zim has been working on this forever. It's a receptor protein phosphatase, very important for axonal guidance. And it's got its suite of enhancers that regulate it and, and, and you know, neuron specific patterns. And there's a metal loop that's a few megabases away. It's an energenic metal loop. So it's not bringing a paralog like sticks and stones. It's just bringing some energenic region to LAR, presumably to give it a new pattern of expression, a new functionality without presumably disrupting any of the old functions. So it's a, maybe an easy way to acquire one new function on top of all the existing functions. Now, how do, you, how do you get that? Well, we don't know exactly, but geez, GA, GA repeats are not that uncommon. That may not be enough, but you can imagine if you have this enhancer here regulating some nearby gene, and you want to swipe that enhancer to do something new in your nervous system, if it gets some GA, GA repeats near it, it may get sticky for a new gene. So I don't know how hard it may be to do that. Of course, if it causes problems, well, you're going to get rid of that. <laughs> that is a failed experiment, and you'll never see that fly. So I, I don't know how hard it is to do. They're not that, that common, but I have a feeling you get a tethering element, and now you have a chance of uh, you know, getting some stickiness for a new enhancer. Thank you, Mike. Great talk. So the uh, whole first thing of the GS control by the doctor is very striking. Uh, it seems to fit into the model uh, of the uh, persistent uh, promoter in cancer interaction is required mm. for the first thing, which mm. Thomas Weber several years ago showed a very yeah. problem. But at the same time, there are others, for example, Alice Terry Bettinger, also from the legendary house of living, I would say, that showed in mouse. Uh, there are also cases where the persistent contact between cancer promoters is not required. Also right. Right. Oh, so is this limited by small? Yeah, uh, yeah, you know, this is a great question. And I really don't know what to say about it. I grew up believing that there was a special Romeo and Juliet relationship between the enhancer and the promoter. And it just doesn't look like that. There's a there's a, a young guy at the Basel Immunology Institute, uh, Luca Giorgetti who's been doing some really nice work on SOX2 regulation, where he moves the SOX enhancer at all sorts of different positions and he correlates contact frequency of the enhancer, contact probability of the enhancer and transcriptional readouts. And he concludes from these studies that the enhancer only has to be in proximity with its target promoter for about a second, on the order of a second or two, in order to do whatever it does. Is it acetylating something? the polymerases on the promoter? Is it phosphorylating those polymerases? That that's a quick step and it's almost random. There's nothing special. The enhancer is surveying that landscape. And if it happens to bump into a stack of polymerases, it induces them somehow. The slow step is that RNA polymerase, unlike DNA polymerase, is glacially slow. You can only release one polymerase every five to 10 seconds because of the Stokes radius and its slow rate of migration. So you have to clear the birth before the next one can go. So if you imagine that an enhancer makes a rapid contact, enzymatically induces a stack of polymerases, and let's say there's 10 or 20 of them, then the slow step is releasing each of those one by one every five to 10 seconds. So over the course of a minute or two, you have a burst, and then you repeat the process. And that resonates with me, the idea of a, of a fast step and a slow step in transcription. We think both. I mean, he, he, so Giorgetti did it all in mouse embryonic stem cells. But honestly, I think it would fit our data just fine. I mean, we had a big journal club in, in the lab to discuss this, and, and we are absolutely thinking about the Giorgetti model in the context of our observations. And I would say, roughly speaking, they fit fine. 
super talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I got to ask more about the. Uh, of course, I you know, I was thinking about you when I showed that RNA. Yes. So the question is, as often is, is it the RNA itself that's right. doing something, right. or the active that's right. That's right. That's right. That's that's right. Uh, you're exactly right. No, the only thing the, the, I could just tell you this one epistasis experiment. So you delete the promoter of the link RNA and you get really precocious activation. You delete the tethering element and you get the delayed activation. And so Philippe combined the two. And I said, geez, I don't know. Combining two unknowns in one experiment seems kind of stupid. But anyway, okay, so he did that. And he gets the same exact phenotype as if he just removes the tethering element. He gets the delay. And so that would tell you that the tether is epistatic to the transcription of the link RNA. Now, is it the RNA or is it the promoter? That's still, you know, right? But we believe that whatever it is, whether it's the transcription, the promoter, the RNA as an entity after it's transcribed, that it is working some way through the tethering elements, since clearly they're epistatic in the, in the, in the double mute. That's the best we can do now. That's, as you know, Jane, uh, Joan, these are hard experiments to distinguish de novo transcription and the function of, a, of, a, of an RNA. This RNA is fairly stable. You know, it has an intron, it is processed, it's polyadenylated, it's a couple of KB in length. I, I, I believe in RNA. So no, I know. <laughs> I know. We, would, we, we, of course, would love the R. Yes. Right. Now, I think Rick Young would say that that RNA is going to help bring the tethers together because those tethering proteins are absolutely undergoing a phase transition. There's no question about it. That's a classic liquid-liquid phase separate. You look at those proteins, these BTB proteins, they, they want to phase separate just by looking at them, right? And so he would argue, of course, that type of phase separation is facilitated by RNAs. So he might argue that having that link RNA in proximity to the enhancer and the distal tether is going to promote the tether, but we don't see evidence for that. Question. Right. So, so all of the above, uh, they are enriched in H3K4 monomethylation as an epigenetic mark. They all have GAGA -GA rich repeats. Half of them bind to polycomb proteins. Half do not, with the exception of polyhomeotic. One of the PRC1 proteins binds. We've depleted the polycomb proteins and it has no effect on the tethers so far. Uh, whereas the GAF at least disrupted 20% of uh, the toporons. But if you want to look for them by sequence, the GAGA -GA repeats are very reliable, very uh, characteristic. In, in mammals, in stem cells, there's um, a young scientist in Spain, Rada Iglesias, who used to work with uh, Joanna Wysocka. And he has evidence that CPG repeats can function as tethering elements. So he thinks there's a polycomb thing. And we do see a polycomb connection, but we've been unable to uh, obtain a function for the polycomb components of the tethering elements. So if you're looking for these in vertebrates, I would say a place to start would be CG-rich islands, CG-rich regions near the promoter, CG-rich regions in uh, intergenic uh, areas. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.